Warning, warning, this podcast contains spoilers. Listen at your own risk. Welcome to Medium Shift, the podcast that investigates how stories stack up from medium to medium through the adaptation process. In today's episode, we're looking at the streaming service Massive Hits that stars Jack Quaid and Anthony Starr. That's right, it's Auntie Donna's Big Ol' House of Fun. <laughs> wait, wait, no, 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 uh, sorry. No, that's, that's the next episode. No, 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 yeah, yeah we no, picked no. up the order. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm thinking, no, this week we're doing the um, superhero one uh, starring Karen Fukuhara, right? About all the superheroes that are actually bad guys, right? Yeah, 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 yep. yeah, yeah that's the one. Yep. Suicide Squad. Yes, great. <laughs> no, 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 it's, sorry, uh, it's both of those things. It's the streaming service about uh, heroes that are really Murray Club star and Aaron Moriarty. It's Jessica Jones, obviously. Oh my god, I knew there was going to be another one. <laughs> Rule of threes, baby. It's the boys. <laughs> Welcome to Medium Shift. I'm Chris. And I'm Ev. And this episode, after too many tangents, we are indeed doing The Boys, the Amazon streaming series that uh, recently wrapped up its second season. It uh, was a massive hit as well, and based off a comic book from the same name from the early 2000s. Ah, so Ev, what did you think about The Boys? I really love this series so, so much. It came at like the perfect time. Mm-hmm. just to really it, and it's that perfect blend of like fantastical escapism and down-to-earth like satire mm. that just works so well it's like hey look at all this stuff but it's also very much on the nose about what's happening right now <laughs> <laughs> really no there's no real analogies between what's happening in the news and what's in the boys i don't know what you're talking about this is completely devoid from our own reality because you know they have they, they have people wearing capes in their universe in our universe we just mm. have Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you wouldn't. There wouldn't be anything like Stormfront here. In... <laughs> no, definitely not. It's definitely not even named after something that actually no, exists in real not. life. No, 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 completely not. No, God, uh, you just gotta love that escapist fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, no, I am a huge fan of this here i do think it is wonderfully done it can be quite a bit out there but mm-hmm. that if you can withstand that you could you see the delight that is this show i absolutely love the little uh, relationships that they have in there i think they've done so well the relationship with uh huey and annie and the relationship between frenchy and kimiko mm-hmm. the what yeah the way they tackle just like relationships as a whole i think is really well done for like this kind of i guess prime time streaming service mm, so it's yeah. a head it's a headlining yeah you call i guess like tentpole streaming yes. show or something like that like it's one of the ones that yeah. like netflix oh sorry amazon <laughs> netflix got uh that amazon like actually advertises like i saw billboards yes. everywhere when the first season of this show first came out so and usually with those you can sort of expect some like big grandiose stuff but it's really hard to get the sort of nuance in there and i think it did, does really well with the nuance basically because everything else on the show is taken to such extremes that the normal becomes nuanced <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah essentially yeah or what if that's uh, just to immediately jump off on your point what i do find interesting about this show especially compared to the comics is that it's kind of a, a character study very specifically mm. at certain times like it is it is less plot driven than I expected it to be at certain points. It definitely still has a lot of plot and a lot of stuff going on, mm-hmm. but it is more centered around the dynamic between certain characters, as you said, um, which I honestly find kind of refreshing. Um, yeah, I mean, similar to you, I, I like this show. I don't know if I'm quite as enamored to it uh, with you. I think it is obnoxiously edgy sometimes uh-huh, um, yeah. to its detriment. It's also unsurprising for a show called The Boys, but it is very, very laddie. 
Mm. Like, it appeals to a certain sensibility that I've never necessarily been a fan of. But all of that is kind of offset by stuff that you already talked about, like actual really, like, interesting character work and some really, really biting contemporary satire and just some good ideas. Like, just the general... I just love the core premise of essentially just superheroes in a... Essentially, superheroes in the world of corporate capitalism and in the media sphere that we're also currently kind of living through and what exactly that would look like. Um, I think is really a really fun and interesting idea and they use that to its full extent, which I just really enjoy. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have my caveats for the most part, but I definitely would consider myself, uh, at least I enjoy, I've, I definitely have enjoyed the show as it's been going on. So yeah. I, I do see where you're coming from with a lot of those little caveats and things, but also I think mm. they've managed to, especially in the second season, try and work it to a bit their own benefit. Mm, kind of yeah. way like they worked out the problems that they had in the first season and they've sort of trying to course correct a little i think it's sometimes like uh, i'll say this straight now major major spoiler alert is... yeah yeah we're gonna say this up front we will spoil the show and we'll probably spoil a number of elements from the comics which might end up being future mm. spoilers for later seasons yes yeah. And yep. this is a show you do kind of want to go in unspoiled if you can mm. so yeah there's some seriously if you haven't watched it yeah. turn this off go watch it then come back mm-hmm all right, yeah. we good? Well, in that case, I think, like, the scene, I think that epitomizes what I was talking about with them trying to course correct is the girls actually get it done scene <laughs> in the last episode. Yeah, yeah. Where they kind of went, yeah, we are very laddie. Look, we're trying to focus more on, like, the women folk. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The females of the species. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm so glad that they've stopped referring to, like, Oh, that, thank is, God. that is one yep. of my uh, big, and I this is going to be, could be potentially controversial. Mm. I prefer the TV show over the comics. And one mm. of the reasons is because they've managed to flesh out the uh, the female dynamic mm. so much better. I, I absolutely, yep. I a lot of that, that is to do with season two. Mm. Yes, season two yep. makes big strides. Um, I think we'll, we'll definitely talk about this more in uh, talking about the mm. comic, but I, I watched the show and then I read the comic. And even though watching the show, I'm like, this is very laddie and I'm not vibing with it. I read the comic and I'm like, oh, the show could be so much laddier if it wanted to. Like, it actually does a lot of work, I think. And I think it still has a lot more work to do, but it has definitely made strides in pivoting to being, frankly, less obnoxiously masculine at times. Um, and season two definitely makes a lot of strides in that regard. Uh, in the process of adapting it as well, it's actually gender swapped a lot of the characters, mm. I think, in really smart and good ways and actually turned them into interesting, compelling characters uh, yes. for those reasons. So, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think the girls get it done as a little bit on the nose. That feels like it felt like the type yeah. of superhero moment that they would make fun of because it's essentially the same beat from Avengers Endgame. But by that same token, yeah. like I, I it, it was it offsets so much of the more obnoxious stuff that I didn't mind it too much. But also at the same time, I'm like, yeah, you're just yeah. kind of indulging in it instead of parroting it anymore. So Yeah, but at least yeah. in this particular case, unlike mm. Avengers, it actually felt a bit more deserving yes. of that yeah, moment. Yeah. One, because they would done all this setup of how corporatized it already is that they're mm. doing it. And then yep. they're kicking the basically kicking the crap out of the face of that campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're curb stomping a Nazi essentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which I mean is immensely satisfying. And it's also imagery that comes from the comics as well, but they completely mm. invert it for the show, and I think in a really clever way. So, which is quite cool. Yeah, I think uh, I. Uh, especially regarding the adaptation of this from like comic to screen, uh, it does a lot of very, very interesting things in the process. It, the most notable, obviously, being for people who are not familiar, uh, the Boys TV show is based on a comic of the same name that was released from uh, 2006 to 2012. It's actually quite successful. It ran for mm -hmm. quite a number of issues. I think it was like 70 plus issues in the end or something. I don't yeah, know something like that. Yeah, I had three different miniseries that happened at the time as well, kind of standalone stuff that's still tied in. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very similar premise at the very least, but there are a lot of major changes. And I think ultimately like quite positive changes between the two of them. So yes, I have to admit in reading this, because like you, I saw the TV show first and then read mm. the comics. And it's interesting to look. And I think every change they did make, well, most of them at least, seem to be mm -hmm. for the betterment yep. of it. Yep. Especially in changing it for the current time. Mm. And I think that's why I prefer the TV show over the comic is because I'm reading the 2006 comics in 2021. Mm. A lot of the stuff that they're talking about was very 
we say of its time quite a bit, but in this particular case, I mean it because it is <laughs> much like the show. It is very much about the politics and everything that was going on at the time. Mm. It was still like as it began, it was still in the George Bush uh, administration. And so that is very reflective in Dakota Bob, the character that they've sort of got replaced and stuff. Yeah. And the vice president as well. Um, Yes. Yep. Yep. I believe the, all. I think, I think Gareth Ennis, who was the creator of the series, one of the creators, uh, outright came out and said that Victor Veep is supposed to be the most obnoxious over the top caricature of George W. Bush possible, (laughs) which kind of speaks to the fact that like politics, the politics of the time that the original comic was being made is essentially a big part of it. And on top of that as well, like 9-11 is a major plot Mm. point in the comics history, which they kind of flash back to it, I think in a really fantastic issue. So um, yeah, you're totally right. Yes. And so this show being this current climate, it just hits that little bit harder. It is so raw and so current. Mm. That, like, looking at this in the same manner in another 10 to 15 years, uh, probably look at this and go, yeah, well, it's very much of its time again. But Mm. for the moment, it is so on top of things. Yeah, yeah. I I hope in 10 to 20 years we can look back at it and say, oh, thank God that we don't have to worry about all the things that it's kind of grappling with. But look, I think only time will tell in that case, unfortunately. Um, But yeah, you're totally right. Like, the show has a level of topicalness especially in the second season, um, the fact that it was it was coming out in the midst of the Trump era when you have a major character in the second season who is essentially a closeted Nazi who uses social media to propagate her ideology. She literally has, like, a line at some point in which she says, like, oh, people love me and, like, want to hear what I have to say. They just don't like the word Nazi anymore. Which <laughs> Homeland has such an amazing response to that as well because he's like, wait a minute, are we the bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> like even for this is the other we'll get into homelander homelander is such a fantastic oh, character yes. in the show but um i i just love the fact that he's this most hideously deranged egotistical person who still has to like second guess the fact that wait a minute am i dating a nazi and is that a bad <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah but i mean like there are so many like contemporary comparisons uh that you you know you kind of have to talk about even talking about victor veep like the original version mm-hmm. of victor veep in the comic very overtly he was a vice for people who are not familiar he was the vice president at the time of the original comic and was like very specifically like pro superheroes like he was controlled by vault america which is why they want him to be vp and later in the comic he becomes the president whereas in the show this is another gender swap character or rather than having victor veep they have um victoria vic uh who is a um a senator who becomes a major character in the second season who people will remember who is secretly a superhero he's blowing people's heads up yes Basically, weirdly, also is seemingly inspired by AOC. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. Yeah. So, like, they've taken another contemporary political figure as inspiration, which I feel weird about. Parroting George W. Bush is one thing, but parroting AOC is, like, a potentially secret corporate plant who blows up people's heads is strange. But it's really hard to talk about that character because she was only just introduced in season two and we don't know what will happen in season three at this point. So Yeah, and if you didn't know our uh, political leanings uh, up until now, <laughs> you definitely know them. I am amazed if you've gotten to this point and you haven't figured out <laughs> where exactly <laughs> we fit on the spectrum. I mean, more power to you, I guess. But um, yeah, no, it's... Uh, I feel like we've I feel like we've made fun of Nazis enough on this <laughs> podcast. The fact that we need to make fun of Nazis to make that clear is kind of sad in its own right, but you know, it, hence the world we live in. But we'd just like to clarify, Medium Shift is anti-Nazi. Yeah, very explicitly anti-Nazi. Yeah. Still sucks that you have to say that these days, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we could start talking about the comic specifically you wanted you. What exactly was yeah. your first impressions when you started reading it? I thought the TV show when I started watching it was extreme. Then I read the comics and went, oh, yeah, this is mm. this takes everything to even, f- like, pushes it to the limits. Mm. It goes all the uh, way up to 11. Yeah, in yeah. both directions. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Um, yep. Like, the character of Billy Butcher is so much more of an arsehole. I didn't think it was even possible from the TV <laughs> show, but in the comics, he's so much more of an arsehole. But also, yep. you kind of love him even more because he's he's so protective of, like, Huey mm. and his family and stuff. Yep, and his dog, Terra. And his dog, is, oh, who, I love Terra. Who is a much, much more... Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a bigger character, but he's <laughs> in, like, every other issue in the comics. Like, he's yes. basically... 
butcher's like animal companion whereas in the tv show he's staying with his staying with his aunt at the time which is a shame i hope we get more terror in future seasons but yes i think i think terror kind of helps to offset his edge just a Mm. little bit the fact that he has a even though it's a bull terrier but still essentially a really cheerful puppy like constantly following around is kind of sweet so peeing on homelander's leg (laughs) yes that's not a care in the world (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) <laughs> i love that line straight afterwards as well it's like yeah if you kill the dog that's that's all bets are off yeah. yeah yeah which comes back later as well when um what's his name homeland is talking to the head of Vought and says yeah we want to send someone after the boys but if do not touch the dog <laughs> if you touch yeah. the dog all bets are off it's a bad idea <laughs> um and honestly i can i can respect that in yeah. person anyway uh, yes. got distracted but terror terror's fine <laughs> Yes. I'm kind of, I was kind of disappointed actually after reading the comic that thinking, oh, I honestly would have loved having like just an animal companion mm-hmm. perpetually in the show, but I kind of get why they didn't. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much to the extreme. I do like it. Uh, I'm not as fond of it, um, especially because like seriously, if you this the the TV show makes you squeamish, mm-hmm. this is much worse. Oh yeah, like that scene. There is a scene in the TV show early on, as you probably know, uh, involving Starlight and the Deep. Yep. That is awkward, visceral, and horrible in a TV show. And Mm -hmm. it is, in the comics, quite literally three times as bad. I was about to say they're triple down because it's not just the deep. Wait, no, it's not even the deep in in the (laughs) comics, isn't it? It's Homelander, A Train, and Black Noir. uh, And Black Noir. Yep, yep. Which is, yeah, no. And that kind of sets a precedent that the, the comic just runs with, basically. Yes. Like, all everything sexual and grotesque is, like, ramped up to 11. So, yep. Yep. Mm. And even, like, the violence and the, like, the scene that is very reminiscent of in the airplane, when mm-hmm. they try and stop it, and the way they spin it in the TV show, it's, like, basically Homelander not being able to, like, accidentally destroying some things and just bailing basically, mm-hmm. without really yep. looking too much and looking after Queen Maeve. But in the comics, it is straight up, basically, 9-11 again. Mm-hmm. Yep. But caused by the superheroes being inept and Homelander not just, like, destroying everything, but not giving a shit about any of the other superheroes either. Mm, yeah, it's not just the passengers that he leaves behind. No. Like, yeah, he just pisses off out of there. Not even Queen Maeve cares. There's a shot no. of her, like, jumping out of the side of the plane and just, like, basically exploding through people. Mm. Um, and we should also specify, when we... T- so we definitely have to talk about this airplane scene because, like, I mean, yes. at least for me, that was hands down the most the, the most compelling scene in the entire first season of the show mm. um, just because it is so openly horrifying. Um, and when we say in the comics that it does a 9-11, we, we don't mean that metaphorically. We mean that quite literally that is this that is the comics version of 9-11. In the boys' universe, essentially uh, the president is familiar with the fact that 9-11 is being threatened at the time and they shoot down every single plane except for one, which gets called off by Victor Veep because... They want to send in the superheroes to save the plane in order to introduce them into the U.S. military, which is how Homelander eventually spins it in the show. But in doing so, they send the entire Seven to go out and stop this plane. And as you kind of know, completely inept, the exact same thing happens. They murder half the people on board, and then this time it crashes into the Manhattan Bridge. And that becomes their, like, quite literally their version of 9-11. They refer to it as September 11 in the show. The comic. Yeah, in the comic, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes. Which is wild. Yeah. Oh, and it also involves the decapitation of Marathon Man. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, that too. Who is like uh, the precursor for A Train? Yeah, yeah. joins. Who joins the Seven just afterwards? Or do I think that the kind of the comparison between those scenes encapsulates like a lot of stuff about the different era? The fact that they tied that original scene into 9 11. You have the entire the seven is there like the scale of the comic just by the nature of it being a comic is always so much larger too a lot of the adaptations a lot of the changes that they made was because they were doing it on a tv budget a very fancy tv budget because this is obviously a high budget amazon tv show but it is still a tv show whereas everything in the comics is much more heightened and over the top and the sequence itself plays out so much more extreme and then you have literally like people smashing through the plane and Mm -hmm. running through people and as uh, several of the superheroes get killed as well black noir literally gets dropped out of the sky 
and no one knows how he survives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the impact of the scene is still very similar. Like, it's equally horrifying yes. in both parts, but it just plays out in different contexts. And it's also those contexts are very defining of the social political landscape that the shows are, uh, the show and the comic are set in. Because mm-hmm. the show, it's the way it's treated, it's very much like a. Um, uh, sort of this is what happens this is how like it's more focused on the spin at the end of it and just what is the betterment of the company and the profits and it's very much that sort of idea whereas in the the original comic it's very much set in a war on terror mind frame mm-hmm. and the way that then plays into things like the patriot act mm. uh which is which is referenced literally in that same issue yep and yep. As well as talking about, like, Vietnam and how that's also affected it. Mm-hmm. And so the way the destruction plays out is very much sort of similar. And the way it's also presented, because in the show, it's, they as they find out, it's recorded on black box and in some smartphones and things. The information is, like, leaks. There isn't as much control. Yep. Uh, whereas in the comic, it was all dictated by the major corporation. It, in this particular case, the comics. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no one really finds out about it in the um in the comic. Essentially, like there's yeah. no there's no overt ramifications at the very least. Um, not in the same way that it becomes a recurring thing in the show. Yeah, no, a really good point. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the one kind of connection between the two of them is the the military defense contracts. Like, I do yes. I do find it interesting about all of the elements that it kept. Obviously, like militarization and defense contracts was a big thing during the Iraqi war, but that thread is still mm-hmm. kind of continuing today in the fact that so much of like Vought's arc is that they want to get superheroes into the military, which yeah. is still scary in its own right, quite frankly. But yeah, no, you're totally right about the spin thing. Like, especially that line, especially the speech that Homelander makes just afterwards. And like, we couldn't get there yes. in time and everything like that. And Queen Maeve is essentially just like <laughs> emotionally dying in the back. <laughs> really fantastic. And really kind of speaks to where the focus of the show is different because of the political landscape. So, and just sort of bouncing off that in a tangent, I absolutely mm. love Queen Maeve in the show, mm-hmm. and I do not care for her in the comics. Yeah, no. no. I think that is very much intentional, but I think, uh, for the comics at least, but in the TV show, I think they've played with her characters so much better, and that's a lot to do with the way they're sort of course correcting, and uh, as well as just the way they're sort of taking on the idea of sort of like the top-down sort of fascism approach. Mm-hmm. So it's very much Homelander at the top, and then dissension in the ranks basically afterwards yeah also just the uh performance by dominique mckelliot but yeah i do think her performance in that is really well done in the second Mm. season yeah i completely agree i think she has a she gets a lot of interesting things to do in the second season yes and i think they're all well earned whereas in the in the comics she's definitely still a background character for a lot of the a lot of it at the very least she still has a similar arc like she's still a massive pessimist in the comic but eventually slowly warms up to um uh, starlight over time which is mm. kind of what happens in the show but it is much more pronounced in the show and, and i yes. totally agree i think in a much better way because they are it does feel like not quite a course correction but they push it more to the forefront mm. deservedly so yes um yeah um i think that's a really good uh um segue to start specifically talking about the characters in question mm. um because i think queen mave is kind of representative of a lot of the ways that the characters are treated coming from the comic to the show and that they are very frequently, like, a lot of their main attributes are essentially the same, but they are explicitly fleshed out and focused on more explicitly in a way yeah. in this series. Um, largely to the benefit, I think, like, especially the Seven get very little character development or characterization in the comic, especially characters like A-Train, who is a flat-out rapist in the comic, is actually given this whole subplot. Same with the Deep as well. Like, the Deep gets a lot of screen time in the mm. second season. Who was an actual rapist in the show? Honestly, I don't know how I feel about a rapist trying to get a weird redemption arc, but um, yeah, but it plays in interestingly with his whole their whole Scientology arc. So yeah, yeah, I was about I'll to allow say it. It. Yeah, and it yeah. means we get Pat Oswalt as talking gills, which I'm all for. <laughs> oh, absolutely! I lost it in that scene when it started <laughs> speaking. I'm like, like just what what perfect casting. You need a weird voice for a psychotic break when he thinks his gills are talking to him. Why not get Patton Oswalt? Oswald. Why not? Uh. Yeah, so no, I think the show does a lot of uh, really smart things to actually make... I care about the the characters in the show a lot more in any way than I do in the comics specifically because they feel more yes. like characters. So, mm. yeah, I mean, we've kind of talked about it already, but, like, Billy Butcher is, like, 
He's very yes. caricaturish and over the top in the comic and in the show as well. Like, let's be real. Carl Urban, as much as I love him, is chewing scenery. <laughs> like, in every, like, just every single time he talks yep. with that ridiculous over the top Cockney accent. <laughs> as much as I enjoy it, like, like I really, really like Carl Urban. Um, but he is still hamming it up like crazy. But even he is given, like, a little bit more to do, especially the yeah. fact that um, in the show his wife is alive. In the mm-hmm. comic, she is referenced and dying off screen, and then that's it. Like, she literally yeah. just gets fridged as a motivation. But in the show, they said, oh, yeah, we want to do something a little bit different and actually keep her around, at least for a season anyway. Then they kill her off at the end of the season, but, yeah. you know. But, yeah, I, I completely agree. I, there is something so human about each of the characters, even the ones that are literally superhuman. Mm. All except Homelander, obviously. Yeah, yeah, who is, like, just a straight-out sociopath. Yeah. yeah. This is the other... Okay, should, should we start talking about Homeland? Because we could probably talk about Homelander a lot. Okay, but just before we do yep. that, I do want to quickly jump back to Queen Maeve. Because oh, yeah. I just, as a uh, a fellow bi, uh-huh. uh, I, that entire uh, storyline <laughs> of them trying to market her as, yep. like, just a lesbian. Because it's easier to digest. Yeah, 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 yeah. That line is, is like, oh, it's so easy, good. easier to understand. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast before, but I know you've talked to me uh, personally about the, yeah. the concept of bi erasure. Yes. They're just like, you have to be one way or another, essentially. And the fact that they turn that into a plot point in the show um, in such like a such a specific and satirical way, I thought mm. was, yeah, no, really great to call that out. Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I just wanted to bring that in because I love that whole arc to pieces. Yeah, yeah. No fair cop. I think that's very good. Yes. But no, mm. Homelander. Now, mm. a person who would probably hate gay people. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. Well, it depends. If they, like, worshipped the ground that he walked on, he would probably be okay with it. But ah, yeah. only to a certain extent. Um, yeah. Homelander in, in the comic, I think, is specifically shown as bisexual. It's a little bit implicit. Uh, I, I, you you haven't read Herogasm yet, have you? No, or, I haven't. Yeah, the first miniseries. There is a scene where him and Soldier Boy wake up in bed together. Hmm. It's, it doesn't show them doing anything explicit, which is actually surprising for the comic because they've yes. never shied away from it before. But uh, they're essentially just talking about it afterwards. And then just as Soldier Boy walks out of the room, he's like, what we're doing right now here is like, it's not gay, is it, right? <laughs> they like they literally have a no homo moment and homelander's like yeah no of course i mean you're soldier but we're homelander we can do whatever we want like we're not gay obviously which i just thought was yeah funny but also in the comics version homelander is straight out racist yes just, also, also very much used that. the hard end word mm. too much <laughs> yep yep just a little bit he's like okay so first and foremost like anthony star does such a good job as homelander mm. like especially if we're going to talk about adaptation from the comics like homeland is an interesting character in the comics because he is like essentially the main villain essentially mm. of the series outside of maybe um vort america itself but he he isn't given the level of like characterization or just honestly the amount of screen time that anti star is given in the show like in the comic he's kind of a bit of a brute like not a like not certainly not like a, a stupid person or anything like that but he feels more like kind of I don't know. He do- he he doesn't feel as conniving. Not in quite the he, way. He's that a he company does in the man in the comics. Yeah, in, like in, in, kind, in yeah, the sorry. sense that he's kind of basically just sort of a puppet for the more evil. Yep. Uh, group that around him that does kind of change after time over time mm. as well in the comics. Like he does yeah. have a similar arc to the show when he kind of in like slowly starts going against Vort. But he has a very specific like speech at the beginning of the first early on in the comics when he says like you do not do anything bad in front of the money which is like yeah. Vault America basically like you do not tow the line and I'm here to make sure that you do not tow that yeah. line. Whereas in the show he essentially starts a form of insurrection in the mm. seven in the second season, I uh, him and um, Stormfront anyway. So and he is in the show a company man, but he also himself believes himself to be the company. And mm. hence why he's a company man, because yeah, 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 this is me. <laughs> yep, exactly. Probably most personified by that scene at the end of season two when he's, I think it's on the Chrysler building or something in New York. Yep. Yeah, he, he's masturbating, basically saying, I could do whatever the hell I want, um, which apparently they wanted at the end of season one, but Amazon thought it was too risque, so they pushed it back to season two, which I mean, look, at least they got it in there at the very least, but still weird. Yeah, but I think that kind of epitomizes him in many respects. Yeah. There's a similar sequence in um, Herogasm as well. I-, I should clarify for people as well who don't know Herogasm. This is another, like, really, it highlights the divergence between the show and the comic in that the comic is so ridiculously out there 
that the way they justify like superhero team ups in the comic is that they they artificially create some sort of like alien threat, which all the superheroes need to team up and go into space and fight. When in actuality, they just go to an island out in the Bahamas and then just like go on a week long orgy with each other, essentially. Like, it's just a bunch of superheroes running around naked for a week, just mm. screwing each other and doing as much drugs as they possibly can. That's never going to be in the show, because that's just way too excessive. No, yeah. But that just shows that there's no real line to the depravity in the comics. And there's also the scene uh, with um, teenage kicks in the uh, brothel. Oh, With the yeah. prostitutes doing a combination of cocaine or meth and uh, compound V. Yeah. Do they call it the blue or something like that? Like, uh, some sort of cocktail yeah. between the drugs or something, which the prostitutes had to yes. use. Otherwise, they might get murdered by the superheroes. Yep, just because of the sex. <laughs> yep, yep, pretty much. Um, yeah, it is full on. Honestly, I'm kind of glad that, I mean, obviously being a TV show on Amazon, there is a limit to what the kind of stuff they can do. But yep. I, I'm kind of glad that some of those scenes didn't really make it yes. into the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, don't I said think... before, this take, the comic takes the things from the show to even further extremes than you thought possible. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think Herogasm is going to show up in the show anytime soon. Um, yeah. No, but no, anyway. I'm thankful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I don't want to see that. Um, but anyway, there was a scene in Homeland, actually just after he has that scene with Soldier Boy, um, when he says something similar to Homeland in the show, when he says, like, I can do whatever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. And his version of doing that in the comic is basically stripping himself naked, flying up, and then just lasering a passenger jet out of the out of the air, which is pretty extreme. And, like, it's supposed to parallel what he did during 9-11 in the comic as well. So, mm. yeah, pretty excessive. So, moving on. Black Noir. <laughs> oh, yeah, God. See, Black Noir's an interesting one. Considering, like, he hasn't really gotten a lot of characterization in the show so far... Uh, he has a he has a nut allergy, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, which is apparently based on the actor. It's more than we find out in the comics, honestly. <laughs> At least to yeah. begin with. Yeah, exactly. In the comic, it's actually <sighs> revealed, and this is almost mm. certainly not the direction they're going in the show because they've already cast a black actor in the role, and I'm I'm sure there's going to be a different backstory and so on. And, and so you know, forth, he's but... dead. <laughs> huh? In the show. Oh yeah, he's he did. Dead. He did die at the end. Oh yeah, yeah. We assume he's dead anyway. Yes. Yeah, yeah, fair call. Cool. I honestly forgot about that because I just assumed that they would bring him back somehow. Um, oh, yeah, uh, I'm waiting for that, given mm. how promptly in the comics they brought on uh, a superhero resurrection. <laughs> yeah, fair call. Cool. They turned that into a whole other thing, whole which, we'll, thing. which yeah. we'll talk to when we get to Lamplighter, so... Yes. Yeah, but uh, no, what's his name? Um, Black Noir in the comic is actually an imperfect clone of Homelander, mm. which is almost certainly what then, probably not what they're going to do in the no. show. So, yeah. Actually, in the comic, this is an interesting thing, but almost all of the seven were raised in the same way that Homelander was in the show. Like, they mm. obviously kind of talk about Homelander being brought up in a facility and very specifically designed to be the Homelander, whereas the rest of the, um were actual, like, well, superheroes who were still company people but came into the seven in different means. Whereas in the show, they go all in on that level of basically raising a superhero from birth. And then almost all of the seven came from that background, so... Yeah, Black Noir included. Once again, talking about how the comic is kind of like more ridiculously heightened compared to compared to the show. In the show, it's sort of revealed that like Compound V was a Nazi invention, but there's also sort of little aspects of how Homelander was born, as whether that was all science and Compound V, or if there was something else. Whereas in the comics, this is just a Nazi defector mm. coming to work for uh, Vought America. Mm -hmm. before they were Vought America, then making the Seven, him getting kidnapped and deciding to slit his own wrists before trying to make more superheroes because he worked out the problem that he has caused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But in doing so, creates a monopoly. <laughs> yeah, also that, which is not ideal. So, no. um, yeah, they do kind of deal with that a little bit in the show through Stormfront in the second season, mm -hmm. obviously. Like um, her husband, her being one of the um, original... Uh, people who got Compound V. Stormfront, mm -hmm. once again, another gender swap character in the comic is yeah. a is a man who has been around since the the, four, the Third Reich. He, he's just basically, he's an obnoxious, he's, he's kind of like Homelander, but more overtly Nazi, essentially. <laughs> and then he speaks in German every now and then. He uses the N-word a lot more in the comics yeah. and so on and so forth. But he, he eventually does get curb stomped by the boys in a very similar way that Stormfront does in the show in the second season. 
Um, yeah. Yay for kicking a Nazi. Exactly. But that's one of the other things. Like, Stormfront's not necessarily a background character in the comic, but he's never as mm. prominent as the rest of the no. Seven. Um, and then for the show, they gender-swapped it, put her into the Seven, and then actually gave her... I won't say a compelling arc, but I made her a lot more of an interesting character by specifically tying her to Homelander. And I just love her whole thing as well when she's in love with Homelander because he is essentially the Aryan race that the Nazis <laughs> yeah. envisioned, like blonde hair, blue eyes, kind of Superman, which is unpleasant, but uh, yeah, very interesting and very much fits yeah. to the fact those Nazi origins are kind of hard to get away from. So, mm. yeah, yeah. God, this show is really just apolitical, isn't it? Like, it's really just <laughs> not picking a side, you know? Uh, yeah, of course not. Yeah. Oh, god damn. Get your politics out of my uh, superhero show. <laughs> uh. Uh, and I love even more so if you just check out the actors, like, social media. Mm, they just yep. double down on all of it. <laughs> like, Aya Cash is the most anti-right-wing fascist you can find. And mm-hmm. she's, of course, playing Stormfront. Yep. Uh, yep. Which is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> which is great. I love that. Good casting. Yes. She's really good as well. Oh, she is. Yeah. yeah. Something about the way that she's, like, she kind of takes aspects of almost uh, a, like, millennial, like, influencer culture, essentially, Mm. but in the form of a superhero, and just plays it off in a way that's, like, kind of smarming and endearing at the same time, while also being deeply, deeply insidious, but you can't really articulate why, especially before you realise that she's a literal Nazi. (laughs) (laughs) Even if the name Stormfront probably kind of gives it away almost immediately. (laughs) But, um... Yeah, but yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and the way she even starts off as seemingly anti-capitalist, mm. in a way. A little bit, yeah, a yeah. A little bit, because she's very much against Vought as a company, but then turns out, oh, because she sees them as being run by, you know, mm. a black guy, and so of course that can't be right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It turns out she's not anti-corporate, she's anti- anti-racist? No. Anti-race? I don't know. I don't really, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> anti non Aryan. Anti non Aryan. Yep, that's the way yep. to describe it. Yeah, no, true. Yeah, speaking of Vought as well, another gender swap character. Um, I keep saying there's a lot of them, but uh, James Stillwell in the comics, yes, who's, who kind of like, uh, he he's actually probably one of the most prominent Vought American characters in the comics, in that he's just kind of always in the background or always kind of organizing what exactly is going on with Vought America in relation to the Seven. Like he orchestrates a Russian coup, which the Seven stops. He sends the the um, payback, which is basically the seven the um, the boys spoof of the Avengers after the seven later in the comic as well, uh, which Stormfront is ahead of actually coincidentally. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in the show, uh, he's gender swapped to Madeline Stillwell, um, who is running like the head of superhero divisions at Vought, and who has a very weird and unpleasant relationship with Homelander, yep. which is completely mm-hmm. invented for the show as well. So yeah, which is real fun. So granted, there are elements of James Stillwell that gets implemented into um, Giancarlo Esposito's character in the second season. Because if you need a gripping anti-villain in mm. your TV series, that's who you go to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially if you tease him just at the end of the first season, yes. only for him to become a prominent character in the second season. Gee, I wonder where I've heard that before. Yeah, he is great, though. By God. I mean, he's typecast oh, to hell yes. at this point, but man, does he know what he's doing. Yeah, He's um, typecast for a reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, nah, is good stuff. <laughs> what I find really hilarious about this, we've been talking about this comic for this show for a while now, and we haven't even mentioned the, the main character yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Huey. We've, we've talked around Huey this entire time, um, which is kind of funny. I mean, look, let's be real. Huey yeah. is not the most interesting thing in the show. Almost by design, like no. he's supposed yeah. to be the everyman that everyone kind of projects onto. Yeah, though granted, he is quite different. Well, his character is similar in the comic to the show, but... um. Mm. Yeah, the depiction of the character is radically different. Yeah, so basically in the comic, the original version of Huey was Scottish and modelled after Simon Pegg. Surprise, yeah. surprise. He basically looks like Simon Pegg in, say, like, Shaun of the Dead or something like that. There was actually, coincidentally, um, a, a film adaptation of The Boys in the Works for quite some years. I think it was a Paramount or Universal when Simon Pegg was supposed to play Huey. But yeah. then it eventually got delayed so much that he was too old for the role. So he ended up playing Huey's dad instead, yeah. which is kind of nice. So they got Jack Quaid in. Yeah. Although I love Simon Pegg, I do think Jack Quaid does a great job hmm. as he, He's Huey. really good. Yeah, I mean, no. look, considering his parentage... Shouldn't yeah. really be surprised, I guess. Look it up, but by God, or his parents just 
Yeah. Anyway, yes. that's not nepotism. He is a, he's a, <laughs> I, I shouldn't criticize. He is a really good actor, though, at the very yes, least. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. I think Huey is not definitely the most interesting character of the show, but I think it is quite a good grounding element in that so yeah. much, obs- like, absurd and kind of, especially in the comics, so much absurd stuff kind of goes on around for it, and he kind of acts as an anchor. Very explicitly mm-hmm. at some points, like, in the show and the comic, they kind of talk to the fact that Huey becomes Butch's conscience, essentially, mm. like, kind of the one normal person to keep him from going off the deep end, essentially. Like, they outright said it, I think, at the end of the second season. And in that respect, like, the character is quite similar in both the comic and the show, even if yes. the visual depiction of him is quite different, so. Yeah, if I had to pick an episode as to why the TV show Huey works well, it'd be the one where Butcher and Starlight are trying to get him to a hospital. Mm-hmm. Because they're both basically hate each other but they both are in love with huey in yep. some way or another and i think it's his relationship with butcher and his relationship with annie that i think is the main like selling point and oh what's the term i'm looking you're not for? gonna call it a love triangle are you no no no, no. just <laughs> it, it is such huge part of the show that like mm. that is almost huey's main role is to just be that conscience for butcher and also like second opinion i guess for annie pulling her away from like because they are just two ends of different spectrums in terms of like Mm. optimism and pessimism yeah and nihilism and god (laughs) (laughs) well look i guess all right fine yeah yeah i I didn't know where i was looking what the opposite of nihilism is no no fair call fair call idealism i guess yes i did yes yeah but yeah he basically just pulls them more into a sort of realistic center Mm, yeah absolutely slowly yeah yeah sure no i think you're absolutely right and i think the parallels between huey and starlight as well as in relation to butcher are like really fantastic too especially since they are both kind of the naive individual being introduced to new teams at the beginning of the show and in the comic mm-hmm. as well just very very different teams obviously <laughs> and that one is joining the seven and one of them is joining the yes. boys so um yeah, but they parallel each other really well. And honestly, like, both in the comic and in the show, but the relationship between Starlight and Huey is, like, genuinely kind of sweet sometimes, I think. So, yeah, oh, bit... I absolutely love the, yeah. their story, mm. which is especially interesting because it's in both the comic and uh, show, I think it's done quite well, the relationship and how that sort of grows and blossoms. But mm. it's also done in a different way. Like, in the show, it's almost immediate that he recognizes her as Starlight mm. after their first meeting. Yep. And he's already very much incorporated with the boys and the boys know about her and mm-hmm. the relationship. Whereas in the comic, it's almost sort of kept separate. Like, it's just sort of they keep meeting up and going on, like, little dates and telling each other about their own work lives, which, unbeknownst to each other, is very <laughs> much related and very much uh, higher standard than what they're making it out to be. Yeah, exactly. They, like, they kind of play it off as almost like a Mr. and Mrs. Smith situation, exactly, essentially. Yeah. That they don't know what the other person is doing and try and keep it separate. Which I think, honestly, in the comic is a little bit played out, even though I get why yeah. they kind of go for it. it. They're just kind of saving it for a later reveal down the line. Um, But in the show, I find it kind of refreshing that they're almost, like, mm. on the same level almost immediately. So, yeah, yeah I think that works quite another, well. Another point for the show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're quite a bit, they feel quite a bit younger in the show as well. I, yes. I, I could never quite gauge the age of them in the comics. Theoretically, they could be around the same age, but they almost feel like late teens, early 20s in the show, whereas in mm. the comic, they're already like both adults, essentially. I don't yeah. know, which like changes the dynamic a little bit, but didn't bother me too much, honestly. Yeah. So, yeah. I actually prefer, and I think that's one of the reasons why I like um, uh, Jack Quaid mm. playing QE in this, because if it was Simon Pegg and someone who isn't, Aaron Moriarty, if there were any other two people, I don't. I think it'd be a very different dynamic to what mm. they have. Yeah, and it would not be the same show. It could be just as good, mm. but it is not the show that we'd be watching. Mm. Sure. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, and I think all of this kind of centers around the fact that I really feel like the ethos of the comic and the show are kind of different when it comes to the characters the other thing with the comic as well and this comes to a budgetary thing as well but the scope of the comic is so much larger and that the boys are like jet setting across the world and everything and going to a bunch of different superhero teams and things like that essentially because they have an unlimited budget they can do what they want 
Whereas in the show, it's essentially the boys and the seven and really just the dynamic between the two of them. It's all centered in mostly the same place and so on and so forth. Like it feels so much more contained. And while it doesn't have that same level of extravagance, I think they kind of make up for it by having so much time Mm -hmm. for characters to actually be characters, which I think is kind of lost a little bit in the show, in the comics sorry, at times. Um, Yeah, which I think is good. Yeah. Yeah, and expanding on that, I think there's also in the show... Again, partly due to budgetary reasons, partly because the way they've sort of gone about with the timeline mm-hmm. of the show, there's a lot more fragility in it, in the characters. Mm. Yeah. Partly because in the show, they're actually just humans. Whereas mm. in the comics, they've all been injected with Compound V, which they've known about for ages, and they are basically superhuman. Yeah, we should talk about that, actually. That is a pretty significant difference in dynamic between the show and the comic. So obviously people who have seen the show would be familiar with Compound V, but in the comic, every single member of the boys has like an injected version of Compound V into them that makes them super tough and super strong, essentially. Essentially allowing them to go toe-to-toe with superheroes in the comics, which I think is largely done from an action standpoint, because it actually means that they can physically fight and defend themselves against superheroes, which they do on quite a number of occasions. Whereas in the show, it's all about running away from them, which I don't... No, like I kind of get why they do it in the comic and especially since the comic Mm -hmm. feels more like a heightened universe, like the quote unquote super soldier serum, like especially in Marvel and DC, Mm -hmm. like everyone and their mums has some sort of weird super soldier serum in them (laughs) and it just feels in line with that at the very least. But in the show, I really feel like it would have changed the dynamic if they went that direction. And I also feel like show, I'd be curious to know your take on this, but I also think like show butcher would be absolutely horrified by having the idea of being yeah. in, by the idea of being injected by Compound V, whereas in like comic comic um, butcher is totally fine with it because he's like, oh, I'm not putting on a cape or anything. I'm just using it to beat down yeah. other superheroes. Well, it's sort of brought up in the comics in a way that they're sort of like, remember, you're not that far away from being a superhero. And it's like, when I start using humanity, wipe my ass, then you can call me a hypocrite or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like comic but butcher like... draws the line in a very different place to show yes. butcher. I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, that's one of the reasons why I like show butcher a bit differently because he's still been that hard ass but he's it's got more of a like a mm. code about him but that in itself leads to sort of because that very much ties into his hate all superheroes kind of thing mm. which is his very black and white uh, morality which is quite a defining feature and weirdly it's that aspect is slightly toned down because of in the comics because of that superpower it's still very much there and he hates soups and stuff yeah but yep. like it hits just that bit different in the tv show mm. because he is just a man yeah trying to take on soups and he's absolutely. just like yep every one of them they can all kill me i should be able to kill all them kind of thing mm. yeah absolutely like in the show it feels pathological essentially like mm. he's absolutely driven to an nth degree to wipe superheroes off the map and it is very much like that in the show sometimes as well but there is a veneer sorry in the comic um but there is a veneer in the comic where the boys are not necessarily there to take down superheroes but to control them to yeah. monitor them and to like keep them in line and so on and so forth even though like it's made abundantly clear on several occasions butcher is not there to keep them in line he's there to take them down but it doesn't play out quite the same way that it does for mm. the show. Yeah, no, I just, I thought that was a really interesting dynamic. And I also, I feel like for budgetary reasons, they wouldn't do Compound oh, yeah, V yeah. in the show either. But I'm very glad that they didn't do that because I think it makes for really tense and intimidating scenes in the show as well. Like, especially that whole thing with Translucent that they kind of freaked out about him in the first couple of issues yeah. from like, episodes. But if they could just like beat him down with their bare hands, like why would that be a problem? So. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think the dichotomy between keeping them like still normal humans just works so much better, and I kind of miss that in the comic. So, and it also makes um, Kimiko's presence a lot more noticeable. Mm, yeah, absolutely. When she's literally like a cut above the rest of the boys, yeah. per se, because she's the only super on the team, so the only super. Yeah, and she could basically take them all down at any given point as well. She does. She isn't an afterthought. She is the main thought. And it's- <laughs> And the thought is, how do we keep her on, on our side and against the other super-powered ones? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, once again, I'm very glad that Kimiko is allowed to do more in the show as well. Because in the comic, she's essentially like a, a mute killing machine. Mm, like, she, yeah. she gets antsy sometimes, and Frenchie's... She's literally introduced as the muscle. Yeah, 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 essentially. Her and Frenchie are supposed to yeah. be the muscle, and Frenchie kind of keeps her in line. And there is, like, 
there is a nice human element to the relationship in the comic, but they just dive into it so much further into the show, yep. which I appreciated. And Kimiko is actually like, especially that whole part in season two when she learns sign language and starts teaching Frenchie mm-hmm. sign language a lot. I'm like, that's so good. Why yeah. couldn't you have done anything like that in the original comics? So And the whole thing with her brother as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like they And now she's tied in with how the they're distributing compound V to mm. terrorist groups. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like it kind of talks to it's the all, thing. With- yeah. Yeah. It's well, all combined. Yeah. Just like so many of the other characters they've adapted, like it humanizes her in so much of a, a, yes. a way and I think is really good. And like she has a genuinely kind of sweet, if sometimes weird relationship with Frenchie. I didn't always love those beats, but I kind of liked mm. where it ended up. So sweet. I mean, like, see, this is the thing. We don't really want to get into every major difference that they've, t- they've taken from adapting the comic, but there is a lot there. Like the show is quite different from yes. the, the original in many, many ways, and many interesting ways, I think. I think this is, as much as I don't love the show all the time, like, I think it's, as I said at the top, I think it's got some really good stuff in it a lot, but mm-hmm. it's let down in other aspects. I do think it gets massive points for actually being a really smart adaptation, like, yes. especially after reading the comics, my appreciation for what they've done, actually, for the show has grown considerably mm-hmm. when I realized where they're exactly they were coming from, so. And also the way they've chosen to use their budget because we brought it up a lot with the whole scope and thing and Mm -hmm. the way they've chosen to use the budget i think really helps keep it all in mind because it feels very grounded and then suddenly ah driven through a whale (laughs) oh i almost forgot about the whale yeah yeah (laughs) every now and then if they can allow it like the weirdness of the comic yeah just just makes just a little so good yeah and honestly i like as gratuitous as driving through the whale is i would prefer that to a superhero orgy so yes in that case i'm more than okay with it if i want a superhero orgy i have the internet for that (laughs) exactly and those like that you know they've joked about making the soup you know the soup porn that they see in season two yeah they've joked about actually making that which is okay Uh, sure i mean look (laughs) Let's be real. This is the internet. People will 100% watch it if it's out there. So, I mean, just I've never heard of someone trying to promote a show like that. But go go mm-hmm. all out. Why not? Yeah, um, why not? yeah geez. Oh, yeah. We need to talk about Lamplighter quickly as well. Yes. We kind of flagged Ooh, that earlier. Lamplighter. Yeah. Yeah, yes. see, we haven't really talked about uh, some of the additional meta aspects of the show and that, like, the Seven has spoofed the Justice League and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, and some characters are specifically analogies like Homeland to Superman, because all that's pretty overt. Like, everyone yes. familiar with comics will see that. But Lampline is a fun one in that it explicitly spoofs the original X Men movies <laughs> <laughs> um, by the fact that they get Sean Ashmore who played Iceman in the original X-Men trilogy, to play Lamplighter, like Pyro, basically the parallel, yeah. in a really fun role that honestly is tragically over too soon. I was really yes. sad that they killed uh, Lamplighter uh, so quickly after introducing him. We should make it clear that it is very much a parody of the original X-Men in the show, because in the mm. comics it's a whole... It's very much sort of feels more like gold, gold, the Golden Age kind of superhero thing and Golden Age Green Lantern mm. kind of stuff. It's yes. very much the inspiration there. Yeah, absolutely. They changed that quite differently. His costume yes. is very different as well um, mm. in the show and all that as well. His, his oh, I wouldn't necessarily say arc, but how they handle the character is somewhat similar in both, I guess, and that he's kind yeah. of short-lived and that he was he was an original member of the Seven in the comic. Uh, and then in the original, when the boys were first created and went after the Seven, uh, Lamplighter was indignant, went out and then murdered Mallory's grandchildren when he was supposed to murder the boys specifically. So that is all exactly the same in the show, per mm. se. But then straight afterwards in the comic, Lamplighter is basically given to the boys as a tree speedy, uh, tree spe- peace treaty. <laughs> um, yeah, who Mallory immediately kills for, you know, obvious reasons, I guess. So like that, the general kind of plot conceit is the same for the character, while also being equally as short-lived but even if it plays out slightly differently in the show. In where I am up to in the comics, mm. it has not fully gone on with the whole uh, storyline of doing the of Resurrections, mm. uh, which they treat very differently in the show. But in the TV show, I think it's done so well as a little gauge of like grief and guilt. Mm. Grief yeah. and guilt, basically. Absolutely. Like, it's a really good arc for Frenchie, basically. Yes. I really like that yes. episode when he kind of reconciles with the fact that he was supposed to be on watch and like, was it his friend Odeed or something like that? And he had yes. to kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is good stuff. Once again, like pretty, pretty decent mm. character work considering Frenchie's given very little to do. And like, we don't even know his backstory mm. for sure in the comic because it could, it's kind of like a Joker origin where it could just be making it up. So, mm. but they actually, you know, yeah. do some more interesting things in the show. And it also leads to the whole Lamplighter's whole little arc 
which is absolutely brilliant of like what it was being in the seven, but then guilt driving him out being in the laboratory working on the compound experiments and then eventually just like turning before just not being able to live with himself once he sees he's been taken out of the statue. Mm-hmm. And yep. just like, yep, I wanted to make this statement and I'm dead. Yep. There you go. Jeez. I mean, one hell of a way to go out. That's for sure. Mm. <laughs> Props for that, I guess. Don't see him coming back like he does in the comics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Uh, I'm honestly kind of glad. Well, I, I doubt they'll do resurrection in the same way that they did in the yeah. comic and the show. I'd be quite surprised. But who knows? Like, this is the tricky thing about talking about the show ongoing. We're only two seasons in at this point, And the show has only gone from like popularity to popularity. So we will be getting mm-hmm. the boys and boys spin off for some time now, which doesn't surprise me. I should mention as well, actually, but like uh, Mallory, one, once again, another gender swap character in the original comic. It's a man who, who started like, um, yeah. who started fighting Vought International actually just after World War Two. He's like, incredibly old kind of like soldier boy or captain america whereas in the show it's just essentially the former cia handler of the boys which like streamlines things a little bit i think which is kind of nice so oh and there's also just briefly bringing up the character of who's completely absent in the show mm. as the legend oh yes who is basically a pastiche of uh stan lee mm-hmm. but if all his uh optimism and hope was turned into despair and revenge yeah yeah. it's essentially like imagine like the the loveliest romanticized ideal of an original comic book creator that you have uh and then just make them a nihilist that's essentially what the legend is he's essentially the the boy's informant um but there's no real analogy for the legend in the show so far which i could definitely see them adding in a later season but yes who knows at this point We've been talking about the show for a while any other final thoughts or should should we move it to do it differently uh no i think we didn't talk much about Starlight, but, you know, mm. we, we've, I think we've talked enough. Yeah, Starlight, I, I will just add what I say for people not familiar with the comics, actually a character that doesn't change that much. Yeah. Compared to a lot of the other characters. Her arc is very much the same. She comes from, like, a small, like, Midwestern, mm. like, uh, what's her name, Capes for Christ kind of background. Like, very, very mm. similar in many respects. Although in the comics, it is very explicit that she gets cheated on by her... Uh, sweetheart oh yeah. yeah yeah they make that pretty overt considering <laughs> yes she walks in on him doing it so with a nun based superhero yeah which is wild once again comics no hold bars yeah really really goes all in um Seri- I will- yeah seriously if you love this show but don't think it goes far enough to extremes read the comics because it's perfect for you <laughs> yep yep it'll tailor right everyone to- else be very careful yeah it was originally published by, um, was it Vertigo? No, sorry, not Vertigo. No. Um, Dynamite. Uh, Dynamite. No, no, no. Uh, they, it no. was originally oh, published by... Oh, the original, by, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was one, it was a subset owned by DC. I don't quite remember. But they got very, very antsy about, um, like, it basically going too fast. So they kind of had to find a new publisher and it was delayed for a little mm-hmm. bit. And then it went with Dynamite Comics. And then after that, it just went all out. Like, no holds Balls to the wall. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Basically. So, um, yeah. Which I mean, look, that's that's the direction the, the comic wants to go in. Sure. I still think there's like, good, like the show. I think there's some good political stuff in the comics and a lot of satirical stuff as well. But I really think the show just kind of crystallizes it in a lot better. And also, as you kind of noted at the beginning, makes it more contemporary and interesting. And also spoofs the media more. There's very little yes. talk of the media in the comics, which I find kind of a disappointing oversight considering mm-hmm. like media management and so on is such like a big part of the show. On that point also I, I think it's the comic was appealing to a comic audience mm. and so that's why all their sort of media work was actually in when they discussed comics yeah and the whole that whole area and the comic fan and in like the legend literally at one point just goes oh yeah but the money's in the tv shows and the t-shirt <laughs> yeah 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 yep. but you want to get them in first with the comics and i think that's why and whereas the tv show they knew they were hitting a younger online culture Mm -hmm. and so and who are more akin to that whole idea of celebrity and pr Mm. so i think they had a better opportunity of being able to play with it yeah absolutely and also once again if we want to talk about the time when the show came out compared to the comic it came out in like the midst of the mcu like riding the greatest wave of success that like superhero dom has ever seen like the mediascape for superheroes is wildly different um in television and film in like 2018 than it was in 2006 so i think the show kind of reflects that in quite a smart way as well so good stuff um yeah i mean look the show is extreme if you're if you really like it go on for it if you need more of the show and if you need the show with more graphic sex then read the comic as well so (laughs) 
yeah, I guess. Doesn't sound like a thrilling endorsement, but like, there are definitely, I know people out there who I'm sure absolutely love the comic. And like, more power to you. Like, I think it's, Mm. yeah. And I am very, very curious to see where the show is, especially now that I've read the comics. uh, Very curious to see where the show goes from here. So, yeah. Good times. All right. Shall we move to do it differently then? Uh, Yes. Yep. Jingle, 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 jingle. All right. Do you want to go first or shall I? I'll go first mm-hmm. purely because I like, again, with the show, the way it's set, I can't really do much. I've got one main change mm-hmm. uh, and that is Jamie the hamster. <laughs> oh God. Do we really want Jamie in the show? Wait a minute. How much of Jamie are you adapting exactly? Like you're not going the whole No, way no, I'm not going the full Blarney Cup. Oh, I just thank want- Thank God. Okay. I just want Huey to have a hamster because I think that'd be- brilliant just all this mm-hmm. wild trueness around and he just comes back and it's like hey little guy just mm. scratches him gives him some food and that yeah that's fine just I'd... a little detox <laughs> i'd be on board with that that's like the, sh- yeah. the role that terror almost plays in the comic yeah basically um, yeah, yeah 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 sure no and far more endearing than the way that yes. what happens to the uh, hamster in the comic ah uh, poor hamster yep uh, that's rough um we're gonna spoil that one yes. you just want to want to find yeah. out what happens to the hamster read the comic i guess because it's Mm-hmm. it's uh it's it's something yeah yep. but there is a reason i called him jamie and not his original name yes feckle, feckle. <laughs> all right awesome hey look no i don't have to percent support that who knows maybe that'll be in season three hmm. we get more animal companions i always want more animal companions <laughs> so yeah unless they're a disney movie there's already too many of them there but anyway yeah i mean for mine at the very least when i go do it differently i kind of want to go in a completely different direction um, in that I would love to see a story kind of set in this universe, or at least a very similar universe to it, but just not necessarily following the boys per se. First and foremost, CAA, not always the good guys, and they are always a very explicitly gratuitous, like, group. Especially, like, as much as the show explicitly tries to play it off, like, this superhero's been in the real world, like, mm-hmm. Butcher is such a cartoonish character sometimes, yeah. right? Like. He's so over the top. And, like, sure, I I definitely enjoy Carl Urban in that role, but it really doesn't always jive with, like, oh, it's real people living normal lives with superheroes flying overhead. I'm like, yeah, nah, this is still a comic book universe. So kind of what I want to see is honestly um, kind of an investigative thriller but set in the boys' universe, kind of in the same vein of, like, um, All the President's Men or Spotlight or Aaron Brockovich or something like that when you're just following, like, a really good and just, frankly, normal group of, like, really crack investigative journalists trying to break the story either around Kong Pan V or around a certain superhero team or something like that. Um, I just think of, like, you could do a lot more regarding, like, specifically the media kind of introspection. Like, this is the one thing, as much as we talk about media manipulation, there's no positive depiction of media in the show, really. Like, it's more like... Mm. Look, it's more look. Look at all this fake news. As much as I hate to use the term, and so on and so forth. But I would just kind of like a positive depiction of what like a place like a New York Times could essentially accomplish mm-hmm. um, in the boys universe by breaking a big story like that, and just like following normal people in this really effed up world and kind of what that would look like. I think would be yeah, yeah really interesting. So you're looking at the Guardian meets the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, very good, very good. I hope I hope you're proud of yourself. Uh... That was actually that was actually quite a good one. I'll give you that. Um, yeah, but no. Anyway, like, um, I I just think that would be a really inter- interesting tangent. And like, as much as I enjoy the show, like the boys themselves can be like a pretty obnoxious or over yes. the top uh, group of protagonists sometimes. So yeah. I mean, if you treat it as a spinoff, it's a great way to adapt the legends. Yeah. Literally, yeah. him as the informant coming in from the comics that. Mm. that- were literally spinning the propaganda. Yep. And yep. it's just like, he's there breaking in. It's like, oh yeah, this is what mm. was actually happening with this team up. And that'd be look a... at all the surveillance we've done at this brothel. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I mean, look, that'd be a really good idea. I mean, look, I would watch a two hour movie of a journalist interrogating nihilistic Stan Lee. I mean, look, let's be real. <laughs> that sounds great. So yeah, good stuff. Uh, I, I don't know how I feel about like a Pope like Homelander. <laughs> Actually, no, we got that. That was, uh, what's his name? Caves for Christ. Uh, Caves for um, Christ. Yeah, yeah, what's his name? That the, one. Is he the really stretchy guy? I don't quite remember. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, that's him. Yep, yep, that's the one. Yeah, oh, damn, the damn one I... who's a The one who's a pastor, but is also in a gay club. Yes, that's right. God, I totally forgot about the whole Christian subplot. See, that's another real spicy mm. thing that I enjoyed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, really, really delightful takedown of, like, conservative religion, religious organizations. Ezekiel, that's his name. 
Yeah, oh, of course it's Ezekiel. Ezekiel, yeah. yeah. That's a little bit on the nose, but I can <laughs> I can respect that. Yeah. It isn't Christianity. <laughs> Understatement of the century. Is Christianity a little bit on the nose? I don't know. Who's to say? It's probably a lot of different civilizations <laughs> of yeah. the time that would probably agree. <laughs> Um, and just to clarify, when we talk about Christianity, we're not talking about all Christianity. We're talking about the mega churches, mm. the like those in those who use religion as an excuse to become more powerful, not yeah. just faith. Religious institutions, per se. Yes. Yeah. 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 More explicitly. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. We as hate the, the faith, love the faithful. Yeah. There you go. As the show kind of does. Like Starlight makes yeah. a distinction between like religious groups and her faith very explicitly at a couple yes. of points, which I think is interesting. So, yeah. No. Still. Good stuff. Well, uh, what have you got to recommend us this episode, Ev, to finish up on? What are you feeling? What am I feeling? What are you feeling? <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know. It's an audio <laughs> medium. We can't dance on. We can't dance over audio as much as we keep trying. Uh. Uh, yes. So I have just over the holidays been just catching up on a lot of my um, comic collections mm-hmm. uh and one that i picked up recently uh in fact you were there for and mm. read quite quickly was the crossover between uh justice league and the avengers oh yeah yeah sure yep just a short i think it was 90s early 2000s mm-hmm. um dc and marvel decided to stick their superheroes together and have them fight it out mm-hmm. the plot is ridiculous it makes barely any sense uh but it's a lot of fan servicey fun mm. yeah that is straight my recommendation because who doesn't love seeing superheroes fight other superheroes i'd agree i've i've read the comic as well and it does some there's some fun character beats as as like yes. generic as i think the overarching story is like the dynamic they play between certain characters is quite good i don't remember is specifically talking about the boys as well i don't remember if it's in that uh crossover if it's in another one but there's one point where Red Skull and Joker are working together only for Joker to suddenly realize, wait a minute, all that Nazi get up isn't like for show. Are you an actual Nazi? (laughs) And Joker's like, look, I may be a homicidal maniac, but I'm also an American and I draw the line at Nazism. Uh, (laughs) Uh. Which is like, uh, look, I don't know if, I don't know if certain uh, like character depictions of Joker would necessarily do that, but I did think it was a very, (laughs) very funny story beat. So Yes. Yeah, that is very similar to one I saw recently, which was just um, Modoc mm. basically headbutting someone and just going "fuck you, Nazi." <laughs> <laughs> that was the entire panel. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good. It's quite good. God, we got to make this and Nazis on our show more of a common thing. <laughs> get too much joy out of this. Yeah. Sorry, not to get. Not that we want to get political or anything. Not uh, like the okay. boys is political. Yeah, cool. I mean, for my recommendation, I honestly don't have anything strong, but like uh, specifically thinking about the boys and rewatching bits and pieces of it, I figured I'd recommend something else that Carl Urban has done. I think Carl Urban is mm. like great. He's had some real fun stuff over the years and all that jazz. And there's actually a comic, another comic book to film adaptation. Um, that when I first saw it, it has been a while since I've seen it, so I have no idea if it holds up, but I quite enjoyed it at the time. Okay, Red. this is one or two things. Red. Wait, which one were you yes. going for? It was either going to be that or Thor Ragnarok. Oh, yeah. I thought about Thor Ragnarok, but, like, you know, everyone already uh, knows Thor yes. Ragnarok. Um, yeah, but no, also, Red... Wasn't he Judge Dredd at one point? <laughs> he was... Oh, yeah, Dredd is... Oh, maybe I should recommend Dredd instead. Mm. Yeah, good point. No, no, all right, I'm gonna pivot, I'm gonna just... pivot to Dread. <laughs> um, I was originally gonna go Red, which I think is like a, a fine, decent action mm. movie. But Dread is actually a legitimately great action film. Um, adaptation of Judge Dread, played by Carl Urban. It's essentially the Raid, but set in Mega City One. After people are not familiar with the Raid, it's kind of like it's a very enclosed where everything happens in one specific environment where he's kind of making his way up this tower. Um, I don't think it's anything necessarily revolutionary, but I think it's just a really fun and explicit and also like R-rated like superhero or well, not even not really superhero, but like comic book adaptation. If you like the boys and if you like especially like gratuitous violence, um, and if you like Carl Urban, because this is a great performance by him, I would definitely recommend Dread. So yeah, good stuff. Thanks. Good save. I feel much more positively <laughs> recommending Dread than I do Red. So, ah, um, God, how did I forget about Dread? Also, I guess everyone also forgot about Dread. Also, watch Thor Ragnarok as well. So, oh yes, also watch Thor Ragnarok as well. 
Yeah, it's a shame because Dread like bombed at the box office as well. It yeah. got, kind of got a raw deal, which I think was a bit of a tragedy. But yeah, who knows? They've been talking about doing a like a Dread series, Mega City one, for a while now. So that might happen mm. one day. That might not. Yeah. Who knows? But... Yeah, but they've also been saying that about uh, Punisher. Yes, and that was also had a great uh, second, uh, like uh, had a reboot mm. that did really that was good, but did terribly in cinema. Mm. It's like, we could do something with this and then nothing happens. Yeah, yeah. No, granted, for the Punisher, at least we got the TV show, which is actually pretty good. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That there too. was that. Yeah. Yeah. John Bernthal is a good Punisher. But no, anyway, um, this has been a long episode, but I think a really good one. So thank you to everyone who listened to this episode of Medium Shift. We can be found at mediumshift at gmail.com. Feel free to send in all of your, I don't know, superhero spank bank or something like that. <laughs> um, that's probably a thing. I don't even know if I'm using that right, but anyway... I don't know, but the fact that there is uh, a porn parody scene of the boys already, mm. like, I wouldn't put it past it. Yeah, there almost certainly is, no question. Um, yeah. Especially with Homelander, and probably Doppelganger, and probably Madeline Stillwell in there somewhere, as long as some, as well as some milk. Um, oh, no. Ah, God. We didn't, even, we didn't, we'll save Mother's Milk for another episode. When season three of this show comes out, which may be a while, because it's probably going to be delayed, though, we, I think we should definitely do another episode on it. I'd be on board with that, sir. Um, but anyway, until then, far, far down the line, uh, next episode, we're going to be starting, which I think is actually our longest running series. It will become our longest running series so far, in that we are going to look at every single theatrical released depiction of everyone's favorite web slinger, Arachnid. Um, no, we're doing Spider Man, so. Arachnid is an actual <laughs> character, though. I didn't pull that out of my ass. Yeah, so starting, uh, though, that being said, starting next episode with something that you're probably not expecting. We're looking at Spider-Man, as written by James Cameron. (laughs) I did Uh, not mean for that to sound so clickbaity, but it's true. (laughs) And potentially starring Michael Jackson. That is is not a joke. Uh, (laughs) So until next time, fare thee well. Jings. Jings.